Welcome to the interview series entitled From Suffering to Success. I'm your host, Michael Hart. This podcast series is a forum for sharing our own stories of struggle and ultimately success in spite of learning challenges like dyslexia. My guest today is Javon Hay. Javon is a former NFL football player who has quite a history of his own. He recently chronicled his life story in his book entitled Bigger Than Me, How a Boy Conquered Dyslexia to Play in the NFL. Of course, it's available at Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com. That's BN.com. He's been gracious enough to join us today. Welcome, Javon. Thanks for having us. Uh, thanks for thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, uh, it's it's uh, I guess it's an honor to, to be in your presence. I, guess. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> well, yeah, but, no, but thank thank you. Thank well, that's you. great to have you. So I thought what we'd do to start with uh, is for me to just kind of paraphrase what's on the back of your book because I think it really, it's a great uh, encapsulation of the challenges that you overcame. So, and this is an interesting way to start because I think, as you said, according to the NCAA, only nine in 10,000 high school senior football players eventually play in the NFL. So you achieved that rare dream, despite overwhelming odds, born in poverty, immigrated to the U.S. at an early age, lived in violent, low-income neighborhoods, suffered abuse at home. You spent your childhood believing that you were, quote-unquote, a dumb kid because of undiagnosed dyslexia and a host of dyslexia-related conditions. And then you discovered your gift for athletics. Oh, yeah. You know, it's just everything in a nutshell, um, you know, um it's very, very hard to, you know, become a pro uh, football player. You know, everyone, there's a, there's a lot of kids that, you know, go on to college and it's rare. I think it's, what is it, 275 kids get drafted every year to the, you know, NFL draft and there's thousands of them that uh, enter into the draft. So it's uh, it's real tough. It was always, you know, an honor. It's always been a dream of mine ever since I was, I, was, I guess, you know, ever since I came to the States. Um, you know, watching the New York Giants and the Jets play, but um, you know, it, it's it's. I, I think being dyslexic, overcoming whatever overcame. I think it's it's what makes me who I am, and uh, it's a blessing. I I, I've, I tell people all the time, you know, my dyslexia is. Uh, I guess it's my. If I was a superhero, that would be my um, my superpower that I'm dyslexic. So I don't see it as. Uh, Right now, at least, I don't see it as something negative. I, think, I see it as something positive. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I mean, you know, in spite of everything, I mean, become a honor roll student, right? Yes. Graduated from Vanderbilt University right here in Nashville, yeah. which is amazing. We're going to talk about how that, how, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> holy never, smokes. Never thought that would ever happen. Right. And then, <laughs> and then seven years in the NFL. Yeah, seven. Could have been a little longer, but, you know, I put myself in a position where, you know, I, I, it wasn't 100% my choice, but, you know, I could have came back and played, but uh, I was just ready to move on. Yeah. Now you're a husband, father, two beautiful girls, successful businessman. Yeah, just trying, trying to do something, you know, like I said, you know, the title of my book is bigger than me. I don't know what that is yet, but, you know, there's something that's driving this. Uh, I know it's God has his hands on it, so I, I'll just keep going along my journey and see where it takes me. So uh, it's something bigger than, you know, at the end of the road, I don't know what it is yet, so. Well, you're doing all the right things, I think. Trying to. Yeah. Trying to. Well, let's go back to the beginning. Um, you were born in Jamaica. Yep. About a large family. Very large. Yeah. <laughs> uh, moved to the U.S. when you were six, but when you were in Jamaica, in the book you talk about as a very young child, you had what we know now is a very common precursor to problems like dyslexia, which is that severe issue you had with just being able to speak language clearly. In fact, you called it um, a nonsense language. Mm -hmm. So what was that like? Talk to us about oh, what that was like. It was tough. You know, I had a bad stuttering problem. Um, you know, um, in Jamaica, you know, they, they look at you, either you're a smart kid or they call, you know, what they call dunce. But uh, you know, having a normal conversation with kids, you realize there's something, something's not right here because these guys are, you know, their words are coming out fluid, and you know they they use common sense. And I think at the time I I lacked both. 
I would do some stuff where, you know, I even questioned myself, like, why would I just do that? And, you know, you, you used to get picked on, but it was by your cousin, so you know, you knew it was love, but you knew something was there, and the stuttering just made it even worse, because you don't know what you want to say, but when you do, and you try to get it out, it doesn't come out, so it was tough, it was really tough. So you also, the, the impulsivity and the, the activity levels, that you it was really the ADHD that you're mm -hmm. talking about as well. Yes. So you had a serious stuttering issue plus ADHD. Yeah, and in the Jamaican culture, especially back then, you know, it's it was just, hey, I have a dumb kid, and that's it. And no one, it's not like it was in the States, you know, that's why it was, uh, it's like night and day. You know, there there's no such thing as, you know, speech therapists and all that where I live it was just say hey, you <laughs> you just either had a, a smart kid or a dumb kid and I fell into that category and, I, and we were talking about this before the interview started and that was that it seemed like perhaps if you, one of the saving graces was that regardless you were loved yeah always you know I just always I, I've always had love everywhere from my parents you know my brother my relatives I've just always always had love because at the end of the day you know, they knew something. Actually, they didn't even know something was wrong. They just, I guess, just accepted it. You know, this mm -hmm. is what it is as a, you know, being such a young child. But I've always had love. Um, you know, Jamaicans, it's a different type of love. It's a tough love, but always. Mm -hmm. I've always had support. Mm -hmm. Then at six, you come to the States. Yeah, and then that was uh, when I realized that, you know, or they say I'm not, you're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> and I realized I'm not in Jamaica anymore. It's a different world. You, you said in the book, uh, uh, your first day of kindergarten was like landing on a hostile planet. Yes. The, look, the kids look like scary giants, and they all look like they're, like you said, they're alien. Mm -hmm. but you, ma you made one comment that I thought was really interesting. So, oh, well, also, you were the first time you were actually a minority. Yes. Right? Yeah, because I didn't, to be honest with you, the only time I saw white people, honestly, was watching Days of Our Lives. Uh -huh. It would come on. It would come on uh, when watching TV in Jamaica. That's the only time. So I've never even saw actual another race in person. Uh -huh. Never. It was wow. all black people. Wow. Like, not one in person. So Days of Our Lives was all I used to see. And that was even black and white. So we didn't really have color. Only a couple channels had colors. Huh. So, you know. Well, there's one thing you said that I wanted to ask. You said more than, you know, uh, the fact that you were a minority and they wore no uniforms, they wore stylish Foreign uh, clothes, is that what you say? How do you say that? Oh, foreign. foreign. Yeah, foreign. That's what like Jamaicans foreign. call. It's foreign. like foreign, but yeah. we say foreign. You said more than that, they, they had a different way of moving, speaking, and behaving. I thought that was a very, very interesting thing for you to say. What, 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 is, what do you mean by that? I mean, first of all, you know, when you, you, you hear them talk, it doesn't sound like the people where I came from in Jamaica. The, the language wasn't the same, it was English. Didn't, I, at that time, I didn't know it was different types of English, you know. Yeah. I thought it, you know, like I said, I didn't know anything existed outside of Jamaica. So to hear people talk, it's like, okay, he says it's this word one way, but it doesn't sound like how we say it. That, that kind of got me um, the dress. I mean, yeah, let's be honest, you know, it wasn't, you didn't have to wear, back in the, you know, we call it khaki, which is the, um, the uniforms. These kids didn't wear uniforms. They wore regular clothes, sneakers. So that kind of, you know, that caught me off guard. And, you know, like I said, the way they moved, it was just like, you know, Jamaican, like, there's a lot of freedom when I was in Jamaica. And it's just, you could just tell that, you know, this is, this is not the same. And at that time, you don't know anything about culture. Well, at least I didn't know anything about culture, but I just knew that it wasn't Jamaica and I wasn't too fond of it at first. Yeah. You know? Well, combining that with the, uh Academic challenges. Oh yeah, class. I mean, it was, yeah, it was, like, it was, yeah, it was on the real. You know, but being in Jamaica, they used to, I used to get a lot of. Um, I used to get whoopings. Yeah. In school. Yeah. Uh, actually, one of my principal was actually a relative of mine, and they, he would just go to work on me. But you know, when you get things wrong in Jamaica, they'll whoop you. They'll hit. They'll hit you with belts, uh, rulers, you name it, and they'll do it in front of the class, in front of everyone to see. So you know. As far as academics, I struggled down there. I didn't expect it to be any better here, you know. But it, it was it was ten times harder in the states. Yeah. Well, I guess you know from reading your book that you really uh, they really took it to you at home. 
Yeah, yeah, you know, I, uh, there was no sense of understanding that, well, maybe like you said earlier, there was no model for understanding, okay, well, this is what he's presenting with, so maybe there's something that we can do about it. Mm -hmm. You, you got to think, no one really knew. No one knew. So they're thinking he's just, a, like I said, a kid, just, I'm not smart and not trying, so, uh, and, and not doing. So you just always got punished. You got, like I said, in Jamaica, you got punished in school. So I'm like, well, if you get punished in school here, you know, it's the same thing that you're going to kind of get at home because that's, that's, that's the culture. But it just feels like somehow there had to be a kernel in there somewhere that you kept alive in order for you to get through all those years of struggle and failure, getting hammered, basically. Mm -hmm. And I know that athletics was one of the first places when you got on the field you'd achieve some success and a sense of a team and a sense of belonging. But how do you understand? I mean, there's a there's a ten thousand guys that grew up just like you and ended up dead, mm -hmm. or a hundred thousand, millions of guys. What what do you think that kernel was in you? That that light, that fire that was that stayed lit. Uh, you know, I've always said. Uh, actually, it was very interesting. I had a conversation with a uh, high school kid yesterday, and he was saying that hey, you know, he looks up to me, and I've made it. And I told him, I was like, no, man, I haven't made nothing. I said, the day when I die, I could make it to heaven is the day I'll make it. Mm -hmm. I have made it. I'm just living my life right now trying to lead by example. So I think back then I just knew I wanted to go to heaven, but I also wanted to, you know, I'm not perfect. I wanted to uh, be a disciple of God in some way. And I said to myself, you know what, that's what the disciples did. They moved to help each other and they didn't live for themselves. So I think that kernel was, you know what, I just want to be able to leave back a legacy or something where someone said, you know what, he did everything he could for others and he didn't live for himself. And, you know, the day he died, he said, hey, you know, you hear a lot of times when someone dies, oh, he was a great guy. He smiled all the time. You're like, uh, you never said that when he was alive. So I tried to, I tried to move and live my life where I say, you know what, if someone said the day I died, they said Javon always had a smile, he always looked out for everyone. I think that's, that's that kernel. Hmm. I want to be known as someone who actually walked the walk and didn't live for himself. And I think that's what it was. So even as a young age, I knew I had a bigger purpose, but you know, when you're that young, you just don't know. When you're, you're, you're struggling with academics, you know, I knew for me to get to where I, I need to get to and allow this kernel to, I guess, you know, develop into, you know, popcorn or whatever it is. Um, I need, there's certain steps. I need to go to college. I need to go to the NFL because I knew at some point, let's be honest, I needed some money in my pocket. And a lot of things I want to do and accomplish to help others, it takes money. And I just knew I had to walk that line and make sure, you know, each step was calculated. And I got to a point where, and like I said, I'm still not done now, but it's part of my journey and it's not about me, it's about mm -hmm. others. You know, I want to be a Bill Gates where I can say one day I could give back $10, $10 billion. I swear, I want to and give it to because at the end of the day, you know, that's, that's all, that's my goal. Mm -hmm. You know, that'd be cool. That's, that's me. Yeah. So who was the first teacher that grabbed you and said, Javon, you can do this? Uh, there's two, but the first one was Miss um, Patton. She was my English teacher in high school. and. Uh, you know, I, I trust me. There was times I, I knew I was dyslexic. That was after the fact that you know I was diagnosed with dyslexia. You know, I used to just use that and go to class and not try, not do anything. Um, it's crazy because I'm like this now. If there's a topic that interests me, I'm all in. I focus and get it done. And that's what she she told me. She's like, you know, pulled me to one day after class and was like, Javon, you you really you're amazing because you know. At times, you act like you don't care, but if you get a subject or a topic or a chapter that you like, you're all in. And she was like, I know you're dyslexic, but you need to stop using that as a way out. And she broke it down, man. I remember like yesterday, and I cried. I cried. She was like, them tears don't do anything for me. You got to change. She's like, you're going you're gonna to end up just like everyone else that you, you don't want to be like. And I was like, man, you know, and that really hit me. I went home, man, and just, I just cried. You know, just cried and cried and cried and couldn't stop crying. Mm. You know, so I think that was the first time someone actually just, you know, pulled me aside 
an individual pulled me aside and said, stop using this as an excuse. But then again, I had no one in the dyslexic community that reached out and said, hey, Javon, I know what you're going through. You know? mm-hmm. And like I said, no one really knew what I was going through. I went to a public school. Yeah. They got special schools right now for kids that have learning you know, challenges. I'm in public school right. with normal, so-called normal kids. Yeah. So she was the first one that ever pulled me aside. She's still around? Uh, yes, but I haven't, I haven't seen her in a while. She's uh, moved on from uh, my high school. You know, I'm, try, I'm trying to get in contact with her, but right. you know how it is when you, when you yeah. go away for a couple of years, yeah. you know? So, Boy, it would be a great gift for her, though. Oh, yes, I, and, I'm, did and I'm still working. Because it's a crazy thing, my actual best friend named Troy that I mentioned in the yeah. book, yeah. he died. Oh, he did. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. He died back in 2000 and I think nine. And I oh. just, I, I, we did some research. We got a private investigator because we could not get in, 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 you know, get in contact with him. And I actually reached out to, um, they were selling a home, and I reached out to uh, the uh, uh, the realtor. And he just acted real funny. I was like, dude, I don't want no money. I'm not calling for any money. He was one of my best friends growing up. And he was like, well, I'll pass the information. Well, I, now I knew why he didn't want to tell me because Troy was actually passed he passed on oh, years boy, ago I'm sorry to hear that. so i found that out so i was like i, I do want to reach out miss Patton before you know yeah anything happened before i go or she goes whatever. yeah that'd be a great yeah. gift for yeah. both of you yeah. what a kill what a great what a great opportunity mm-hmm. so what about the second teacher yeah she was uh miss knight <laughs> she was um jamaican and uh you know unlike miss Patton, uh you know i had miss Patton every day but you know once i had that talk you know things kind of straightened out but Miss Knight was, whew, she was bad because she was like having that, that mom or relative or that aunt every day you see her. Mm. And she's Jamaican. Nowhere so to she, hide. Yeah, nowhere to hide. She didn't put up with a lot. She really didn't. She, she would explode on the kids because, you know, let, I'm not saying all cultures don't stand, you know, you know, disrespect or, you know, a lot of disrespect to happen. You know, but because everyone doesn't like to be disrespected, but man, something about Jamaicans, they they have their particularly te- fierce. Yes, and their temper is so so that their temper is so so thin. And I look and I was like, man, I had this lady every day. So when I wanted to laugh and joke, she would give me that look and she was like, You're lucky. You're lucky the school system don't allow me to do what I want to do to you. <laughs> so that she helped big time as far as academics and just allowing me to actually grow as a man because she just always stayed on top of me. You right. know, I'd come back, my brother had her, and she used to tell my brother, you're nothing like your your uh, your brother, you know, because my brother, he's loud and loved playing around, and, but I, that's how I was. But having Miss Pat, I'm not Miss Pat, Miss Knight changed everything. And like you said, it's just having like that, that Jamaican parent right. every day. So that one hour, Trust me, nothing happened in that one hour. I went, I did my great, did, did my work, behaved, and left. But somehow, I mean, I don't, I don't think we drill down into this too much. But between that point where you touched those two teachers touched you, mm-hmm. you really started to excel in the athletics. Um, you prepared yourself for Vanderbilt. I mean, that's a very, very high level. How did that work? I didn't prepare myself for Vanderbilt. I really didn't. I prepared myself to go to college. You prepared yourself through football, <laughs> football. to get recruited yes. to get into a good school. Dude, I didn't care where I went. But you, you know? chose a so you chose a relatively small school in the SEC. Yes. I didn't know anything about Vanderbilt. I knew nothing you about Vanderbilt. You came because your buddy came yeah. to Vanderbilt. Yeah, my, my friend Nigel Seaman, he decided to come because Georgia Tech bailed on him at the last second. So I only came here. I didn't I knew I did not know where Nashville was. I didn't know anything. You know? Just an impulsive decision. Yeah, I chose to go um, to take my recruiting trip that weekend over Ohio State. I called Ohio State and canceled on them, telling them I'm going to Vanderbilt this weekend, that weekend. So it's I didn't prepare myself for Vanderbilt. I just prepared myself to, hey, if one day when all these scholarship letters start coming in and I start getting recruited, that I could be able to go somewhere and relieve my parents from having to you know, pay. find another dime to pay for college, so I didn't care where I went. Yeah, but there's a gap in there, Juwan, mm-hmm. because, you know, in my profession these days, having to do with dyslexia, a lot of kids have to go through very, very intensive uh, remediation and training, you know, the Orton Gillingham or 
some kind of multi-sensory mm -hmm. stuff. So how did you muscle your way through that? I mean, Vanderbilt is a very, very high level academic university. Yes. So um, how did you, uh, w w that's the missing piece for me, as I understand. It, it was, like you said, you know, once Miss Patton sat me down and having Miss Knight, you know, I would just pray until, you know, I asked the Lord, hey man, I, I, I'll just show you have a conversation with him, like, look, help me out of this. I'm, I really have somewhere to be in the next couple of years and it's not looking good. But what happened was once I started playing basketball, JV basketball, you know, that, that helped me. That helped me buckle down because I knew now, remember when I played in middle school basketball, grades weren't, you know, you were gonna, everyone make it through. I don't know anyone that doesn't make it through middle school, but high school is a challenge now. So I knew in order for me to continue playing JV basketball, I had to make sure my grades were up. So that, that was the first step where I said, you know what, I cannot make it to college on an uh, uh, athletic scholarship unless I have my grades. So I just told myself, you know what, it's time to tighten these screws. But in the meantime, I was still trying to find ways how to, how to tighten the screws. Meaning, hey, I don't party, I don't hang out. You know, I've been called gay. They call me gay all through high school because girls wanted to talk to me. And I'm like, mm, nah, I, I don't have time for this right now. You don't know what's going on with my life. I struggle. I don't need any more distractions. <laughs> so it was just things like that where, you know, like just reading ahead when I knew a chapter was coming. Because a lot of times I used to go to class and be like, okay, dear Heavenly Father, please don't let the teacher call, on, call, you know, call me out today. And here goes the teacher calling me. Now I got to read. And I used to get, I used to get embarrassed because once I start reading, I start stuttering and, you know, words are jumping over, and, you know, over on the book or whatever. And guys and girls are looking at me like, is this really happening? So I used to get so embarrassed. So I said to myself, you know what? No more. Can't do this anymore. If I know she gave us three or four chapters, I'm reading three or four chapters. And there's any words in there I don't understand or struggle with, I underline it and I'll look it up, look up the definition or whatever and read it out. So I said, you know what? So that when I knew, I come back to class and you know, normally I used to be looking out the window or looking at girls or, or whatever. No, I'm reading along because I said, you know what? If she, she's not gonna catch me off guard. Hmm. You know? And I used to have you know, that little paper and make sure I read along each line and, and then drop down to the next. You know, those are things I did and just little techniques where I said, I'm not going to be caught off guard anymore. Mm. You know, and it's just little things like that. I, you know, I count my fingers still. Yeah. You know, yeah. I still do to this day. But I said, I'd rather be caught counting my fingers than, you know, getting it wrong. wrong. Yeah. You know, and that's uh, stuff, you know, those calculators. You know, when you, you know, when you have the basic calculators and now they have this $150 calculator, I was never a fan because that right there scared me. Those those lines, squiggy lines, and you know, what is it, square roots and all that, and you press this and press this button, you get the answer. I was like, no, 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 I don't need the answer. I need to figure out a way how to get to the answer. So I stayed away from all that. I kept basic calculators, and you know, if it took me longer. You made dots on a page. Yep, mm -hmm. and that's why like, I've always struggled. My SAT, SATs weren't great, ACT weren't great, because time tests, no. Yeah, no, no, no. I'll read four or five times a question. Yeah. And every time I read the question, I look at the answer. Come back and read the question, look at, look at answer B. Mm -hmm. And the same way all the way through all the answers. And then, then I'll read it one more time, and I'll say, you know what, it's, it's C. And, but it took longer, so, but at the time, like I said, no one knew this. Mm -hmm. No one, you know, you know, you're supposed to, I guess, it's now you're supposed to tell, you know, SAT people and ACT people that you're dyslexic and they're supposed to give you some extra time, but I didn't have all that, so. You know, but I, I just learned ways, you know, um, just to get around it. Hmm. Boy, that's an amazing story, yeah. I gotta tell you. But, but trust me, once I, once I knew I needed to have the greatest of grades, because I knew I was gonna struggle. On the, I trust me, I knew that from my freshman year yeah. in high school. I said, there's no way I'm gonna do this test, because you hear, hey, start preparing years from now for the SAT, ACT. I said, well, you know what I need to do? I need to make sure my GPA is high enough that way they could overlook the ACT and SAT. I could just get the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. And then my, my GPA would be so high that it makes up for it. And that's, yeah. that's what exactly what happened. I had like a 18 on the ACT and a 9.35 in the SAT. <laughs> but I had a 4.5 GPA on a yeah. 4.0 scale. Yeah. 
So, yeah. yeah. I'm just thinking about that first day you walked into a Vanderbilt classroom. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't even, that wasn't even it though. It was, it was before then. It was um, summer school. Summer, summer school. Summer, uh, yes. your, your, uh, your summer football yes. season. You know, and I, I, had, I went to a party, you know, first time on a college party. And uh, this uh, cornerback, his name uh, J Mac, he was like, hey man, what do you want to study? I was like, man, I want to be a mechanical engineer. He said, mechanical engineer? He said, you know what school you're in? I said, uh, Vandy. He said, do you want to party? I said, well, I really don't party. He said, do you study hard? I said, well, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to be. He was like, you may not want to do mechanical engineering because no one makes it through Vanderbilt with that. No football player. No football player. So when I sat there, I was like, you know what? What's the next option that he told me about, you know, HOD, Human Organizational Development? I was like, we'll probably go that route. And it's the greatest decision I made because yeah. I, I know how to flunked. I almost flunked out, you know, with the, my, uh, the major I chose. So I already knew if I would have went mechanical engineering. But that's what Vanderbilt would do to you, man. It makes you question what you want to be, where you want to be in life because the school is it's that hard. Yeah. So, you know, the first day getting there, it was before, like I said, the summer. When you got to class, though, first day on campus, and you realize, oh, wow, this is, you're not in high school anymore. And, and you get there and you see rooms of 300 people. And, you know, it's, yeah, oh my gosh. It, it was very intimidating. Would you have done anything differently? I mean, looking back now, would you do it? Would you have gone somewhere differently? Somewhere different? Ah. <sighs> You know, like I said, I, I don't like to say I, I a don't, bigger SEC yeah, I don't ever, school. I don't ever regret anything I, I do. But I, would, I, I, I wonder sometimes, what would happen if I would have went to Auburn or Georgia or yeah. Ohio State? You know, um, I don't know. Could I got lost in the shuffle? In you, Ohio would State? you have made the same numbers, right? Yeah. On you the know, field. I look. Would I've played that early? Yeah. Because you got, I think, I played right guard in high school on the old line. And I got recruited as a, uh, a linebacker. Right. So I never played defense before until I got to Vanderbilt. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think I, my ability was always there. I think that's why people recruited me because I played special teams and they realized I could run for days, you know. But I don't know what would happen if I would have went to a different school, you know. Football-wise, yes, I wish we, I would have won more games and Vandy was a little better at the time, but, you know. Once you got over that that part, I think I wouldn't have made any other decision. You know, got a great education, which is very overrated. Oh gosh, it's the most overrated thing. And I, I know people, people say, oh, "How could you say that, man?" A Vanderbilt education means nothing. Because huh. I know people that went to South Carolina that get the job ten times hmm. faster and easier huh. than someone that went to Vanderbilt. You huh. know, it's about who you know, not what you know sometimes. And yeah. it's, it's just the truth. I know guys who have graduated from Vanderbilt that work to you, deliver at UPS. I'm like, dude, you got a, a Vanderbilt degree. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. But yes, so if people are want to say, hey, you got a Vanderbilt degree, yes, it's, I, I do. It's on the wall at home, you know. But it's more than that, man. The degrees don't determine anything. Mm -hmm. Anything. Well, we moved through your life and you had a successful MBA career. You've written this book now. Your wife got you to write this book. Um, now that it's over with the book, was, was there, would there be anything that you'd take out or anything that you would add? Um, no, I wouldn't take, I would not take anything out. It's, um, it is, it is who I am. It's my life. This is, this is my story. Um, would I add anything? Uh, no, I, I, there's certain things I didn't put in here for reasons, but I, I, I don't think I would have added anything. I think it, the book turned out well. Um, you know, some people feeling got hurt as far as my mom, but I tell people, hey, it's my story. If I kept out a lot of that stuff, I don't think I would have been able to write a book. You know? Well, I think, you know, if I can mm -hmm. speak, the purpose of the book is to inspire other kids. Yes, that's all it is. Right? Yes. So you tell them the truth. Yep. And the truth, I don't want to say the truth set you free, but the truth really, I mean, it, to talk about the difficult relationship you have with your mother, um, it's going to free up a lot of other kids 
to do the same mm -hmm. when they have parents that misunderstood yep. them mm -hmm. and felt disappointed in them. Yeah, you know, and like I was telling my mom the other day, I said, this book wasn't written, you know, because it took two years, two and a half years. It wasn't written from the way I view life now. It was how I viewed it then. Mm -hmm. So it's not like when I say, oh, you know, I wish my mom would have been there. I'm not saying it doesn't bother me now. I've moved on. It, I'm just letting you know, at that time, when I was young, in high school, yes, I wish you would have been at more of my football games or, you know, it, it supported me in football and certain things, but it doesn't bother me now because I know, trust me, if it didn't happen that way, I don't know where I'd be, you know? So it's almost like, it's almost like for me, for my life, I needed that. I don't see here and say, oh man, it, you know, I, I hate her or I wouldn't do anything for her because it's not. I love my mom to death, do anything for her. But that's just the way she chose to raise me. That's mm -hmm. the way my, my parents chose to raise me. And I don't apologize for it. I just want people to say, hey, you know what? Some of y'all may have gone through this. Some of y'all may not have. But, mm -hmm. you know, if you are, hey, it's, it's, it's not the end. If you want it bad enough, anything in life, that's just that's just part of your story. So I just you know want to inspire kids, you know, whoever to let them know, you know, it's not a death sentence, man. The way you were raised, because at one at, at a point now you have to be grown and you got to move out that house, and then you start making you know your own decisions, and you start you know become a family man or a family woman, and then you know your parents really they they still exist, but it's like you, you're not under their roof anymore. So you make the decisions. Abraham Lincoln once said that after a certain age, you're responsible for your own face. Yes, and that's 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 a hundred percent true. Right. At a certain age, so you know I can't look back and oh, mom, this, mom, dad, dad, this. No, like you raised me, I thank you. You made me who I am today, and I move on. So that's why, you know, that was the hardest part when she's you know she's crying and she's like, hey, the whole world. I'm like, mom, the whole world truly don't care. The book wasn't about <laughs> my mom who. You know, yeah. would treat me a certain way. No, the book is about inspiring kids and, you know, living a life like that with dyslexia and, you know, half your life, people not knowing what's going on. And, it, and like I say, it wasn't, tell her it wasn't about you. It was about me and the way I saw it. I don't, you know, I don't care how you saw it. It's, this book is through my eyes, not yours, you mm -hmm. know. But she, she understands it. And I think at the end of the day, I'll write it over again. Uh, out and without hesitation. No one could ever make me change and not write this book. Well, my last question was, what message would you send to all the kids? But I think you just answered that question. <laughs> well, I mean, I could go into further. I would just tell kids, man, it's just, you know, for me, I, I, I look at, you know, schools where kids have learned, you know, challenges and I've gone to schools, public schools, and you just see sometimes, man, I think the society has brainwashed a lot of these kids. I don't think parents, I don't even think parents have, no, have a choice right now. It's so tough because what they see, what they hear, and I look at kids in public school and I used to say, man, you guys have, what an opportunity you have in front of you. Free education, if you act right, do right, you can have a, continue your free education either through, you know, get an academic scholarship or athletic scholarship. And I see a lot of kids just wasting it, man, because they get caught up in, you know, what society, everyone thinks is, is right in society and how society is. But, you know, I, I, I would just tell kids, man, just just learn learn or, or try, try a way to be different. Try a way to be different. When everyone's going right, just go left. It, it's okay to go left, you know, mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, you have to worry about you and you have to have a, a better, I guess, you know, a vision, a better future for yourself because everyone is not going to be around. Everyone, you know, I used to wear that jersey on my back and it says, hey, and I said, that's, it just, it says, hey. It doesn't say Peters or Williams, it says, hey. Mm -hmm. So I got to worry about me and do me. So I don't, I don't you know, just don't let, don't let everyone know. You don't have to be like everyone else. You know, dare to be different. You know, I love when I see the punk rock kids and all that, and they got the earrings and the tattoos, and they're not bothering anyone, but that's what I love. Mm. Dare to be different, be different, you know? And you yeah. don't have to, 
society, man, it's just, you get caught up in what society views as, as, as what's in right now. You don't have to get caught up in all that. Well, I think it's a great way to finish today. Um, I want to thank you, Javon, for joining us, and I really appreciate your time. No, no, thanks for having me. It's man. a great story. I enjoyed it. Um, name of your book, Bigger Than Me, How a Boy Conquered Dyslexia to play in the NFL. I get it right that time. <laughs> now, in the next week or so, I'll be announcing our next guest for our show, From Suffering to Success. If you have someone you'd like to hear on the show, please let me know. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach, reach me at Dr. D-O-C-T-O-R, Michael Hart at gmail.com. And be sure to sign up for my free newsletter at drmichaelhart.com. Thanks much, and we'll see you next time.